Hi, welcome to everyone's favourite segment, Mailbag, where I open my mail. Let's get straight into it. First suck of the salve comes from the old dart royal mail here from someone everyone knows, Mike. Mike Harrison, just undo it. Yes, Mike from Mike's Electric Stuff. And he's sent, uh, thank you very much, Mike. He has sent some sort of uh, motor, is it? Well, let's crack this sucker open and uh, see what Mike has sent. If Mike has sent it, it's bound to be interesting, I'm sure. So if you haven't, of course, um, seen Mike's video blog, he's a fellow YouTube video blog. Hi Dave, found this for 99p on eBay UK and thought you'd appreciate it more than me. Uh, it seems to be basically working, but the front button seems to have a lot of springiness and stick down. Perish rubber? Yeah, probably. Uh, maybe fixable by putting a fine wire coil spring between the button cap and the body. There is a mysterious yellow jumper link in the battery compartment. No idea what it's for. Alright, let's check it out. Mike from Bikes Electric Stuff. Here we go. Ah! It's not a motor, it's a, oh look, oh yes, the Hyoki Calc High Tester, oh 99p, what a score Mike, brilliant, thank you very much, um, this was on the forum some time back, if you don't know what this is, folks, it is a combination calculator and multimeter, <laughs> two of my great loves, I love calculators and this is like the world's, I think the world's only, combination multimeter and calculator and you might know that might know the name Hyoki they're a Japanese uh, company and they've um does it work no it doesn't work oh hasn't got a battery anyway we'll find out but yeah combination multimeter there we go positive and negative input not very robust at all I mean that's uh, it's pretty creaky i don't really you know i don't get a good feel for it but this is um i believe from the late 80s i think i'll have to double check this 200 millivolts dc to a thousand volts are uh, pretty typical two volts doesn't have millivolts uh ac unfortunately current yeah not much there's no high current stuff in this it's only 20 milliamps 200 no microamps and uh 200 ohms to 2 meg and low power ohms as well which you don't get these days it's got the uh, low power button yet yeah, low power ohms there it is um for those not familiar the uh, low power ohms function basically uh, limits the test voltage in the ohms function so it doesn't turn on any diode junctions this was very common back in the day um you know the uh, you know 1980s vintage uh, multimeters a lot of them had this low power ohms thing but it doesn't seem to be very uh, common today at all so there you go let's some um, uh, wax and batteries in it and uh oh 1981 is it there we go is that i assume that's the date code because that's not a, not the model the model is 3208 so i assume it is 1981 vintage let's wax some batteries in see if this puppy works well i whacked a couple of batteries in it and it does seem to work calculator works anyway um even though it is switched off so obviously uh, low power calculator uh, circuitry in there probably completely separate would be my guess completely separate circuitry in there dedicated chip just uh, completely uh, just uh, hooked across the battery because low power calculator chips of course you know a dime a dozen even back in uh, those days it'll you know run forever on a couple of AA batteries basically the shelf life of the batteries that's why they don't bother putting it after the on switch because you may as well just leave it permanently on it you know it draws like a microamp or something like that so it works all the time so I'd expect uh, them to you know not be tied in any way the calculator and the uh, multimeter entirely different circuitry so let's uh, turn it on and the multimeter seems to be working I do have it connected up oh there we go it took a while it took a while I've got it hooked up to my 1k precision resistor here and it's a little bit out but uh, it did take some time to get up to that value so yeah, it's not the not the world's quickest thing, that's for sure. Well, there we go. Yeah, it takes forever. Slow as a wet week. Now, the first thing I notice is that this screen is awful. It's atrocious. One of the worst screens I've ever seen. Now, this is on an angle, not, you know, not hugely off vertical by any stretch. But look, it's got some weird sort of, you can see the uh, background 
pattern on that almost as if like it's a dot matrix but it's not it's a seven segment display but there's some weird sort of grating thing happening at the back i'm not sure or it looks like the back and really you can only it's you know the digits are only crisp and clear when it's directly on like that i mean that i tilt it to a small angle and that's just me almost over the top and that is just that is awful and it just gets you know it, it's just a, oh, horrible i don't know what type of lcd that is and you tilt it in the other direction and it's not a huge amount better either well it certainly is well flake oh look i lay the thing down on the table and i'm getting 350 ohms and i just tilt it up like that and it goes to a k so there's something horrible going on inside this sucker oh my goodness anyway as far as the calculator functions are uh, concerned here it's not entirely fully featured there's no engineering mode for example um but you know it's got all the basic uh trig functions it's even got uh, rectangular to polar polar to rectangular uh conversion uh you know what else dedicated one on x button dedicated square root dedicated um register exchange key i like that so you know it, it works you know it's a reasonably useful scientific calculator but yeah i don't know the whole concept is just it's just dicky you need the right tool for the job it does have a continuity buzzer of course absolutely horrible but it is at least a latching type and once again that tilting thing 0.3 volts in this 9 volt battery which i think is dead and there we go 7.07 .07 when i tilt it <laughs> you've got to be kidding me but in any case, that is actually uh, within spec, so it does actually work. What has it got a tilt switch in this thing or something? And there's only one thing left to do, crack this sucker open. We may have to take the batteries out as well. Um, yeah, there was talk about this calculator on the uh, forum and people uh, posted links to it. And that was, I don't know, maybe six months ago. And I did try to get one on eBay, but I think they were... Uh, not available at the time. Ta-da! There we go. We're in like Flynn. Well, it looks like we're going to have uh, well, mostly through hole construction on here, although I expect the calculator part to have a uh, quad flat pack or a chip on board. Uh, probably under, I don't know whether or not it's under the LCD, probably on the bottom side of this board. We'll have to take it off. Curiously, look, there's a copper shielding tape uh, just like on the battery. Why do they need that i'm not sure what they're doing they've got the negative from the battery over here coming over and connecting to that and presumably something connected on the other side there but i don't know that's you know um got no idea why it's a spark gap between the inputs there so that's you know a modicum of input protection i guess i wouldn't expect to find much else in this i don't think this is uh, uh going to be a hugely rugged multimeter that's for sure Check out those segments. Obviously, the LCD has uh, degraded massively over time. You can see the shadow on the bottom uh, part of that, but that is that is just awful. That is there's something gone horribly wrong with the uh, liquid crystal in this stuff, and it's just uh, faded out. If anyone knows what the failure mechanism is there um please let us know because that is horrible i haven't seen anything that bad in oh forever i think look side on you know it's not too bad but you can see it just faded out that is awful okay now it's becoming fairly obvious why they needed well wh what that copper shielding is for they've got it between all of the ribbon connector they've got the clear ribbon there over there no there's nothing connected to the other side so it literally is just a shield over there i'm not sure why they why they needed that really i mean you know um at the frequencies this thing's working at i'm not sure you know why they would bother with that but eh you never know what's that under there that is, oh that's the fuse okay there we go so that's that's our fuse connected in there. Little piss ant wiring, of course, because it's only like 200 milliamps. And there's no HRC or anything in this. And it really is just bodged construction. Anyway, 
Let's have a look at the bottom side of the calculator. There we go. As I said, uh, quad flat pack. They've actually got two of them. NEC chipset. Um, yeah, they're all uh, custom for the day. And uh, what is that? Let's have a look. Is that a little regulator? No, that's just a C945 transistor. Boring as. So really, that ribbon cable is just effectively bringing all the segments from the multimeter uh, chip here over to the top side because, you know, there's there's nothing else. It's just the, the calculator's fully self-contained on here. So the only thing it needs is uh, power, the three volt power from the batteries coming over. So it only needs uh, the two wires there. The rest are all for those segments. So, you know, it, it really is quite a kludge, but oh my goodness, look inside this thing. I've got the custom ganged switch mechanism from Kanbayashi Co. Limited. And we've got a big ass piezo uh, buzzer there, which is pretty uh, pissant for its size, actually. And it looks like two custom single in line. Yeah, they are single in line arrays there in a uh, molded package. And uh, they're probably, uh, no, I was going to say the voltage dividers, but look at this. This is a rather interesting arrangement of is that a you know is that a voltage divider there and is that a strip can I lift that up I wonder let's give it a go yes I'm not uh, sure what's going on there with that but that seems to like have a it's almost like it's a strip of FR4 on the top just joining all those resistors together creating a single inline or a single inline array and then uh, we've got a botch resistor over here, it's like, oh, really nasty stuff. I mean, they had SIP resistor packages, and they've just, in back in the day, and they've just rolled their own. You know, trim a cap for the uh, calibration, presumably. Huge, big uh, 104 ceramic cap here. Um, probably, you know, they needed the voltage there, I guess, but, you know, there's no uh, isolation slots in this thing or anything like that at all, really. It's just quite a bodge. I mean, here's the cable coming in from the top from the positive input terminal down here. It runs under here and then just joins bodgily down in there. I mean, this thing is just awful. I think we might have a fuse down in there by the looks of it. A couple of diodes for protection on the input and, well, you know, not much else. So I wouldn't be going measuring the mains with this thing, that's for sure. There we go. That's the underside of that single in-line resistor array there. They, they've just shorted them all out and sort of like glued it in place like that. Jeez. And by the big bulky nature of this custom molded single in-line package, you would think maybe they've done something similar to this uh, resistor network here and they've just, you know, got some parts in there and then they've just molded right over the top of that thing. But, you know, oh God, you probably never find data on those. Sorry, that white wire on the other side is actually the uh, negative input terminal. The positive input terminal is over here, of course. As I said, they've got a spark gap there, soldered in. The wire is just, it goes to the fuse here, and then it jumps onto the board. Down in there, it looks like we have some heat shrink over something, maybe the uh, input protection resistor. Probably our uh, high voltage input caps there, and those two over there are probably our sampling caps because they're right next to the single chipset uh, multimeter chip which was very common in the day sing uh, you know quad flat pack like this dedicated in a single chip these are all the rage back in the early 80s and well they, multi most multimeters today are still exactly the same just a single quad flat pack nothing's changed in 30 years so there you go what more can you say about that it's a pretty atrocious multimeter and not a great uh, calculator really once again complete you know, and basically like a product fail, one of those marketing wanks. Oh, let's, you know, combine a, be novel and combine a multimeter and a calculator. It sounded great in the uh, design review meeting. And then, well, you know, execution is, is pretty poor and essentially pointless because you always end up, when you try and combine products like this, you always end up just doing it half-assed and, you know, half-assed multimeter, half-assed calculator. Ah, oh, I don't know why they bothered, but hey, at least they gave it a go, which is better than nothing. So that is rather unusual. Probably the world's only combined multimeter and calculator. I don't think I'm aware of another one. If uh, you are, certainly uh, leave it 
in the comments. And I stand corrected on my comment that this thing uh, wouldn't have any connection between the multimeter and the calculator. It certainly does. In fact, it has a shift button here which shifts the current reading into the calculator so that you can operate on it. And there it is, 66 point something, 66.5, and it even knows it's milli. Look at that, millivolts. Fantastic. Oh, now I'm actually quite excited. Hmm. So it's really interesting how they've integrated that functionality into this thing. And, you know, it would have taken a bit of effort. They couldn't just use an off-the-shelf calculator chipset. It would have had to have some sort of data interface, and it transfers it very slowly. So I don't know whether it goes over a... Well, probably goes over a, uh, a serial interface, given that I think a lot of um, those, uh, th those connections on... The um, LCD there are, well, on the, the cable going between the board are for the LCD uh, segment. So, yeah, they're probably running that thing over a serial line from the DMM chipset, which, again, would have to have a custom output for that over to the um, calculator chipset. Really fascinating stuff. And, yes, I did check online. The original data sheet for this thing is available on the Hioki website. And they, of course, list it as discontinued. It want to be. It's 32 years old. But it's still their excellent quality scan of the original data sheet. It's just brilliant. Definitely check it out in the links below or on the EV blog website. So thank you very much, Mike, for sending in this awesome bit of um, uh, well, multimeter and calculator history from the 80s. It is just beautiful. It really is. I mean, you know, it's practically, you know, it's a poor multimeter and it's not a great calculator, but eh, at least it's novel. And we have one just arrived from St. Petersburg in Russia. We don't get too many from Russia, and I'm not sure how that name, I presume that's uh, somebody's name who sent it to me, and it contains, well, I guess I see parts. Uh, quantity? No, 300, 100 pieces? No, value, so that's the value. All right, let's crack this thing open and see what we've got. Here we go. How does it open? How does it open? No, there we go. Don't get too many from Russia, so hi to all my Russian viewers and uh, everyone from the former Soviet Union. How many uh, states were there in the Soviet Union when it uh, broke up? I don't know offhand. There were a lot. And, oh, looks like I've got some crusty old parts. We have a note. Oh, it's very brief. Hello, Dave. I found some old IC components made in the USSR. Maybe it can be useful. Yes, the USSR, um, the former Soviet Union. Oh, thank you very much, Oleg. There you go. Thanks, Oleg. Let's have a look. Crusty old parts. First thing you got to do. Hang on. Well, oh, actually, not really. The crusty old component part smell I was expecting. Got some. Uh, axial resistors here, some nice ones, but these are all made in the so former Soviet Union. Now, I can't read those uh, presumably Russian uh, symbols there, but uh, 1R5, of course, uh, means everything. 1.5 ohms, I presume that's the brand the trademark. So, if my uh, Russian or uh, Soviet, uh, your former Soviet Union friends know who the manufacturer is, please let us know. I presume that's a hundred microfarads in Russian. 1985 vintage, I presume that's the date code, fourth week 85. We've got ourselves a single turn trimmer here. It looks like a multi-turn trimmer, but it's not. Just try to only single turn. And 330, is that ohms? I guess it is. Could be 10%. It looks like we have a 1986 vintage 100 nanofarad high voltage cap. And that's obviously a 250 volt, 200 microfarad cap. And uh, interestingly, it's only got one connection on the end like that. So the other one, you know, there's no hole there, nothing's broken off. So it must be uh, the other end is the can. Wow, this is a real interesting trimmer cap. Look at that. It's designed to, I don't know whether it's PCB or socket mounted or something, but tiny little trimmer on the top there, and uh, look at that, 5%, 1.5 ohms, 
680 ohms, presumably, or is that uh, 2 meg? I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, uh, 10th week 1990. This one's pretty recent, but that's a real interesting package. Looks like it's been salvaged, got some solder on the leads. And they made their own micro switches. There we go. Beautiful. So you've really got to wonder about, you know, all these companies and all these people that worked at these companies, you know, it must have been huge manufacturing all these resistors and the capacitors and the, you know, all the semiconductors and everything in the uh, former Soviet Union. So maybe we've got a viewer who uh, used to work at one of these plants or if they're um, still going, presumably um, there's still plenty of uh, local manufacture left around there, but I don't know. Um, uh, please, viewers, uh, let us know the current state of the industry there and if any of these uh, factories and manufacturers are still going. Next up, we have one from Pico in Brooklyn, New York. It was teed up that uh, I'd be sending this, and it is. Well, I won't tell you. I'll open it up. You will. That's what it's all. What's the point of me telling you? That's a bit of a bit of a letdown. But. Uh, they sell this. You can buy it on, uh, I believe you can buy it on, um, uh, what's uh, the, uh, Tindy. Tindy. Anyway, let's have a look. And this will come in handy very shortly. In fact, this week, it's the Pi Pico. It's a solder paste dispenser. It's a Pico paste pressed. And basically what you do is you put the syringe in here and it dispenses a set amount of solder paste. Looks like a really nice bit of kit. We have a letter here from Jonathan, and uh, yes, we did mention this thing on the Amp Hour, so that's where he heard it and uh, sent it in. comes with a whole bunch of uh, tips, and more can be found out. Yes, I was right, uh, Tindy.com. They've got a store on over there. Um, Tindy's a place where um, you can uh, buy and sell uh, your own uh, kits and electronic uh, hardware and stuff like that. It's really quite neat. Um, some quick guidelines. Don't try to use a Type 3 solder paste with any tip below 22 to 20, 20 to 22 gauge. Particles are just too big and you'll get poor results. Yes, because the balls, the uh, solder paste, are little little balls, little uh, particles. I've tested Type 5 with needles as small as 27 gauge without issues. The material continues to dispense after releasing the lever first to press the trigger. Tip. For young players, the tapered tips are best for things like adhesive, so when you absolutely want to avoid scratching a board. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And there it is. It's a really neat thing. Better than using a syringe because you can't, you know, with a paste syringe, you can't get, you know, with your thumb, you can't just get an accurate dispense of the paste. It is very difficult, very tricky, a bit of a fine art, and you, you know, overshoot and you get too much paste oozing out. Blah. And it is made in... South Africa! Awesome! I <laughs> love my South African viewers. The Pico Paste Press works like a miniature corking gun. It's the best way to easily and accurately apply solder paste, SMD adhesives, and other high viscosity paste and liquids. Press trigger while pulling down the plunger. At least trigger. Remove end. Blah, blah, blah. Tips. Dispensing should take little effort. If not, try a material with lower viscosity. Awesome! There you go. They recommend Type 5 solder paste. So let's crack this thing open. Oh, frustration free packaging that's pretty good and uh, that is quite neat I don't actually have any uh, solder paste well oh, that feels a bit that feels a bit sticky actually that's not not smooth at all I'm not sure I'm not greatly thrilled by the manufacturing quality of that I think it's built down a price this thing's pretty cheap by the way I'm not uh, sure exactly how much but uh, you won't pay a fortune for this thing but that sort of it's a bit jerky it's sort of not a really fluid motion on no I completely take that back it's because it's the at the end of the travel there so if you depress that and put it right up here so there's the little plunger that goes into the top of your syringe down in there and now the action is Oh, smooth as a baby's butt now. I like that. So it gives a set distance there for your syringe. Excellent. Now, while I haven't tried this, I can see um, that one full depression of the lever really moves that plunger a long way. So 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So 20 depressions to get right down to the bottom. So obviously you can't just press it once and dispense a tiny little pad's worth of paste. 
obviously. Um, it's just going to ooze it too much. So you really have to give it just a gentle nudge like that probably. And uh, really, I will um, hopefully be using this shortly because Monday, today is, uh, what is it, Saturday? There we go. Um, I am uh, getting my uh, thermal oven. Um, but I'll be using a stencil. I don't, but I can order some uh, paste stuff. So I'm getting my own uh, reflow oven. That will be awesome. I'm going to do my new microcurrent board. So I'll probably get some uh, syringe paste and try this out as well. Excellent. Check it out on Tindy. We have one from Brian S. in Tacoma, Washington, in the United States of America. And it is absolutely tiny, open before Christmas. I have indeed. Thank you very much. It's a Christmas ornament. Brilliant. Hope it's something Sagan and we'll can hang on the tree. Oh, look. Check it out. We have ourselves a microcontroller flashing snowman. Well, Unfortunately, um, we don't get snow here in uh, Australia. Merry Christmas. Um, we don't get uh, snow because we uh, Christmas here is summertime. So, well, you know, oops. But, hey, it is cool. Sagan will love the flashing lights, I'm sure. Designed by Brian Schutels, if that's how you pronounce it. Sorry, Brian. Uh, Uniclocker 2013. Fantastic. Little CR 2032 button cell there. And... Uh, Bob's your uncle. This thing is going to flash or do something silly. He even included, thoughtfully, a battery. Let's give it a go. One little thing I immediately noticed, when you slide the battery in here, there's the LEDs exposed around here, the pads, and could potentially short out when you slip that battery in, although it is one of those, looks like it's, you know, um, a decent height one, so you can actually get it in an, in an angle and slightly avoid that but anyway trap for young players it's flashing oh sagan's gonna love this is that the only pattern no i assume it changed yeah it's gonna change brilliant there you go i think i just cycled through fantastic and yes it is open source hardware and the bloody pcb manufacturers left their manufacturing mark on the board and Brian's been watching my videos and uh, the stuff he learned from my videos. He's done this board, so awesome. And it's also available on Tindy.com that he learned about on the mailbag segment as well. It's got an AT Tiny uh, 45 Micro, 5 I.O. pins, so he uh, Charlie Plexi I.O.s to get 20 individually addressable LEDs. Design the board to be end user assemble with through hole LEDs, or as this one, it comes assembled. I put surface mount LEDs on it, seem a bit more regular. They fit in the through hole pads just fine. That's interesting. There's a JS2 connector on the back to allow it to be powered from fiber power supply when hung on a tree. Because, yeah, I don't know, what are you going to get, you know, 10 hours of flashing out of it, probably something like that. Hey, happy holidays, everyone. Yes, indeed, happy holidays. Thank you very much, Brian. And this one I was also clued up that would be sent. It's from Tokyo Flash in Japan, and some people may know them. They are the purveyor of fine... Uh, tacky, uh, as in Japanese tacky, uh, watches, you know, that flash and do all sorts of uh, weird and wonderful, uh, you know, patterns, you know, not necessarily tell the time in any meaningful way, but they uh, manufacture all these weird and wonderful watches based on user uh, user requests. So, yeah, apparently like they've got like a forum or something, and um, you can vote for it or something. This is the uh, Kasai. Is that the model? I don't know. They did clue me up and they asked me which one I wanted. And uh, I said, oh, yeah, this one will do. And here it is. Oh, geez, a bit of weight in that. That's pretty weighty. That's all solid, solid metal. So let's, uh, that's backlight. Anyway, these things, I'll show you the function of this watch in a second. But that's really dim. That display, wow, I had no idea it would be that dim. And this model is called the Upload. Why? Because it has a built-in USB stick built into it, basically. Um, that's the reason why they called it the Upload. But yeah, let's have a look at how it actually displays the time. Now this might look like complete gibberish, but it's not. It is one of these angled displays. So you've actually got to tilt it on an angle, which isn't really working here because I need something that's, uh, uh, you know, the right colour behind that before you can actually read the time or read it really well. It's designed to be, you know, one of these optical illusion things that only really becomes 
good when you're reading inside. Oh, let me see if I can work with the background here. As it turns out, this is really quite hard to get. And if you turn it, it's like on uh, camera, that is. But you can see in very narrow digits, 12, 57, 51, 52, 53, and then counting up in one hundredths of a second, which I really like. But yeah, it, sorry, I can't really, you know, the glare on the screen, just when you tilt it at an angle that makes it readable, is just, and they're too squished together. It's, ah, oh, it, it's just useless. As a practical watch, it really is hopeless, but well, that's half the idea of these Tokyo Flash watches. They're not really practical, they're art, I guess. And, uh, that's not the camera doing that. That LCD is really, you know, quite poor. In fact, it's probably showing up better on camera than what I'm viewing it here in real life. Just a little bit better for some reason, but the contrast on it, straight on, is just awful, but I guess you're not supposed to read it straight on, but the whole idea is that you look at the, you know, people can see that it's flashing over and doing some arty farty type stuff, right? That's the whole point, and really the backlight is just, the backlight is just, you know, it's pretty darn hopeless because it's, you know, not even at all, they really need an even backlight on that thing, so that's just, that really is hopeless. So yeah, who cares about the watch? Let's crack this thing open and uh, see what's inside. It's got little tiny Phillips there, ultra tiny, and uh, well, I'll come back in a second. All right, let's take the, take the back off. Single CR2032, uh, there's the um, micro SD card slot down in there. So now I was wondering where the USB port is on this because it is, there's the USB card, but it turns out it's, can you, yeah, pull that off. It's a bit clunky and there we go. It uses a uh, TRS jack and there's the USB to uh, TRS adapter cable with it. Oh look, it's the first watch I've ever had that comes with a screwdriver that allows you to take it apart. Brilliant. We can just leave uh, this board out of here. I have a uh, strong suspicion that they reuse a lot of these uh, cases for um, all the watches. That's how they can, you know, spin, you know, a new version of the watch every week or every month or something like that. So there you go. We can crack that open further. Why not? And nothing terribly exciting on the bottom side there. We've got ourselves our watch crystal, 32 kilohertz. You know, we've got a transistor or a regulator, something like that. Some bypass caps and, well, the surface mount uh, contact for the battery. And, well, that's about all she wrote. And let's take this LCD off. Of course, we're going to have some zebra strips connecting that. There they are. They're integral to it down in there. So they've got a zebra strip down there and down there. They go to your pads on your PCB here, and they've got a light pipe. There you go, and just a blob, blob, blah. Nothing more. Not that exciting, I'm afraid. And there's the four side lit LEDs. I don't know, I was hoping to, you know, identify the micro or something like that, but nah, just a blob. Sorry, not that interesting. It looks like we do have a three chip solution. I mean, obviously there's the uh, LCD uh, driver part of it. You know, the main uh, part of the watch is under there just driving the, you know, it's it could just be a micro and they just uh, pre-program it or something like that um, to go to all the LCD segments. So that's the Tokyo Flash Upload watch. And it's like, uh, why? I don't get it. I mean... Uh, Japanese and their gadgets and they're, you know, they're obsessed with these things, aren't they? Pl I don't get it. Please, can uh, any of my Japanese viewers please explain the fascination with this sort of stuff? I mean, it's basically unusable. I mean, I, why you would want this? I mean, the screen is awful on it. It is absolutely awful. The backlight's awful. And the build quality's actually not that bad as far as, you know, it's a nice, heavy, solid metal they've got there and the, uh, uh, clasp here is, you know, is is really quite neat. I don't mind that at all, but it's just useless. I don't get it. 
I don't know. Anyway, Tokyo Flash, I think, got the impression that I'm some sort of, you know, gadget review site or something like that, and they pestered me to uh, uh, take a look at one of these things. And mm, Sorry, guys. I don't get it. Oops, and I forgot some postcards. I know people hate postcards, but hey, I like getting them. Ukrainian Carpathians. Look at that. Excellent. In the Ukraine. Brilliant. Happy Halloween. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't uh, subscribe to the Halloween thing, but uh, yeah, thank you very much for your postcard. Sorry, in uh, Cherkasy in the Ukraine. Instead of a postcard, we have a home printed picture from his own lab. Marcus from Austria. Austria, not Australia. I saw a recent video excited how you were about a letter uh, from a typewriter. How about a hand-printed postcard from the dark room? Brilliant. I can picture Marcus down in his dark room down in the basement printing out all his photos. Do people still do that? I guess they do. Excellent. Thanks, Marcus.